Lori Smith, welcome to Women Seeking Wholeness. Thank you. It's good to be here. You're coming to us from San Francisco, which is one of my favorite places in the world. I told you that I graduated high school in San Jose, so we kind of have that Bay Area thing in common. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so how would you encapsulate what you do? Let's, it's kind of a two-part question. So if you can encapsulate kind of what you do and how you serve with what you do, uh, and then how it found you, like how this sort of, you know, everything that you're about with, um, the courage really to speak, that's what I'm getting when I'm reading your <laughs> stuff, all the courage that you have to summon to be seen and heard. That's the, yeah. So tell us kind of what you do and then how you got into that. Yeah. I am a public speaking and leadership coach, and I would say I specialize in helping people with what's known as their executive presence, mm. which to me is about helping people to really be their full selves and allow themselves to take up space mm. for the sake of their mission as well as to be authentic and be seen while they're doing that mm. and to learn in their blood and in their bones that it's really by being themselves that they can do their soul's work. They can do what they are here on the planet to do. Mm. So that uh, sometimes I say it's about owning your wacky wildness while having a serious impact. And we think we're supposed to suppress the wacky wildness when in reality, it's through letting that shine that we can have our unique impact. Mm -hmm. And as far as how it found me, I am an actor. I've been acting since I was seven years old. And theater has a light side and a dark side. And I love and have been attracted to the light side of theater for my whole entire life. People in theater, particularly the actors, really know how to be deeply present with other people. Mm. And uh, in my experience, I had my own love-hate relationship with being seen the whole time in theater. And I was teaching theater and around that time, a student said to me, I think you're a coach. And I didn't know what that was, but I could tell from her energy, she wasn't talking about basketball. <laughs> <laughs> and I went and felt in my very first coaching class that I was gonna do something, bringing all of these threads together, coaching, eventually leadership and this uh, being seen and speaking on behalf of something. And there was an experience in a theater class shortly after that, where we were doing an improv, um, not a funny, funny, ha ha improv, an improv that was designed to kind of help us stretch into everything that we were capable of. And in this particular day, instead of being partnered up everyone in class was focused on me and like my exercise that day. Ooh, hot seat. <laughs> hot seat, <laughs> you know, literally sweating and freezing yeah, yeah. hot seat. And I kept trying to sort of pull myself together to be fine as we all do. Mm. And my teacher, Richard Side stopped with the loving look on his face that he had to do so many times because it was like, you're not getting what I'm trying to do with you. So I'm going to tell you. And he said, you keep trying to pull yourself together in between these little vignettes. And I said, yeah, I'm not that comfortable having everyone's eyes on me. And he smiled and he said, well, then you've picked a strange set of careers for yourself. <laughs> Part of you. Interesting. Yeah. And I knew he was right. Part of me knew I was meant to be there and craved it and also felt like I was sort of burning up energetically. And I deeply trusted him. So I quit pulling myself back together. I just kept opening 
opening and it felt like layers of resistance were burning away. And when the exercise was over, I looked out at everyone and I could see with one look at each of them, what kind of day they were having, what kind of energetic and emotional state they were in. And I now know that was my first experience of oneness that continued beyond the acting. I'd had them like, I'm gonna play a character and then I'm kind of gonna like sneak myself out into the world through the character. And then as soon as I was off stage, all the walls were back up. That time it was so transformational that it continued for the rest of the day mm -hmm. and um, changed me in a lot of ways. That's fascinating, yeah. I mean, I kind of alluded to this with you when we, before we started recording, but what I found in my work with women and even in living in my own body is that women have this secret craving. You actually even use the word craving to be seen, to have mm -hmm. visibility. Mm -hmm. And it's also, so it's our deepest desire and longing oftentimes, mm -hmm. whether yeah. it's to a crowd of people masses or just your own fam, you know, your own partner, right? Whatever. There's this deep longing and need to be seen for who we are, mm -hmm. to have that visibility. And it's also our deepest fear oftentimes. Yeah. So yeah. we're kind of living with this paradoxical tension around, uh, and I do, and I do what, love what you said about it's the vibration of your soul work kind of like in the middle of that, because it's stretching you. It's like you said, with your acting uh, coach, kind of taking you into like, hey, you chose this. This is finding you. You're here. You chose a real interesting path if you're not going to want to be, you know, if yeah. you're struggling. So, so how do you take that wrestle, that internal wrestle when you work with people and just sort of ease that tension or allow them to, I know it's courage based, but how do you sort of help people with that tension? Yeah. I, it took me forever to get that it's not about what I do or the model that I've created. Those are great. And what, what really helps is to hold a safe, sacred space for them to come out of their shell inch by inch. Mm. And any tools that I have are all in service of that. And I've been told and I believe now that it really is like, those are great. They're great tools. And it's really about holding the space for them. And nowadays, most of the time when we're focused on public speaking versus like sort of have two bits of what I do. One is the, the public speaking for visionaries and the other is leadership coaching, helping them to navigate their daily life mm -hmm. to make that vision real. In the public speaking arena, I almost exclusively work in groups these days, very small, very intimate groups, so that their whole self realizes, oh, I can do this in front of more than just Lori. <laughs> I'm holding the space and then they all start to hold the space for each other as well. So can you define holding the space? I use that term a lot too, but some people might be unfamiliar with what that actually means. That energy, yeah. right? It's an energetic support. It's an energetic support. Uh, some people out there, if they're sensitive empaths, they're probably doing it without even realizing they're doing it. When I help people to find it, I ask them to imagine that they have an energetic set of arms and rather than keeping that energetic set of arms really mm. small and close to their skin, that they expand those energetic arms to energetically kind of hug everyone in the room. Mm. And they're doing that. It's like they set an intention before they do whatever the thing they're doing is mm -hmm. from speaking on a stage to coaching one-on-one -on -one, to leading a meeting to recording a podcast. 
set an intention for what you want the people that are there with you to experience either energetically or emotionally. Mm -hmm. And then imagine that you're hugging them in that, in the energy and the vibration of that intention that you set. Mm, everything is energy, right? So, so if people want to have that physical impact, let's say a visibility or outreach for their platform or whatever art form they're choosing, it's the energy, it's how they're managing their energy. Would you not agree? I absolutely agree. If they want to be seen, they have to learn to wrap those energetic arms. So it's a win, win, win for everyone. Mm. If you want to be seen, spread your love wings, your energetic arms. If you want to be heard, take yeah. up the space, expand your energy. If you want to hold space for others that feel safe, you got to do that. And some people like, I feel like you and I were like energy. Great. Got it. Spread my wings. Not that we can do it instantaneously yeah. all the time, but we get it. Occasionally I work with people who are sort of looking at me like, can you use it? Well, I've had someone literally say to me, can you use a different word? Because I don't see the energy as easily as everyone in the room seems to be seeing it. Uh -huh. And it was a huge gift that he asked in this workshop. And I said, okay, it's kind of like a coin. The, there's two sides and then there's the middle. The middle is this energy thing. The other two sides are intending to include everyone in the room, even if the room is a football stadium, rather than kind of hiding with one person in the front row. Mm -hmm. And the other side of the coin is giving ourselves the permission to be mm -hmm. seen and heard and felt and to take up that much time, yeah. space. Yeah. Who am I to do this? Who am I to, yeah. I think a lot of us wrestle with that, who, who want to have leadership and visibility. And, you know, I've, I've been so intrigued with leadership, especially feminine leadership for most of my life. Yeah. And, and, and it's just. It, it is permission-based. It is allowing yourself. I'm worthy. You know, yes. I, I can take up this space. I can hold this metaphorical megaphone, right? Because I have yeah. things to say and I'm, I'm worthy. And, yeah. and I think that that oftentimes, um, it, it, it is the thing going on between your ears and that, and that just constant, like, who do you think you are kind of messaging? Yeah. Yeah. And all of us, everyone I've met has some version of that kind of an <laughs> inner critic. Who do you think you are? I call it the soul sucking voice or soul sucking voices because they suck the soul out of our voice mm. and protect us when that may not be our highest vision for what we want. And putting our attention for many visionaries, putting our attention over on the people that we're there to serve can help quiet that voice because that part of us that is here to serve is the part that knows I am unique. Mm -hmm. What I have to say matters. I matter. And it's not coming from an ego place. It's coming from the soul right. I'm here to serve place. Yes. And that's and a it, great distinction. Yeah. Cause you see a lot of people completely in ego yes. that are, that are on that, you know, stage or platform. And you're just like, I'm not really resonating. Like you're so charismatic and like, you know, but the soul piece is just not there. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm not even sure if I would call it charisma to me. Um, yeah, that's because charisma actually means of the spirit. <laughs> yeah. You break the word down. So maybe, maybe not charisma, maybe just commanding um, the room. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Commanding the room. I had a boss many years ago before I started doing this work. It was probably one of the breadcrumbs that led me to this work. Mm -hmm. Everyone else loved him. Everyone else thought he was one of the best speakers and a friend of mine and I, who were both actors, were sitting in the back of this company, All Hands, 
And we were, I'm not proud of this to this day, but we were like making fun of the motions, like mm. three, two, one, dramatic pause. <laughs> and it felt like it was empty. And then one day I told him I was leaving to go work for my previous boss, who he had been great friends with. And it rocked his world. And that day he came out there and it was like, he still had three, two, one pause. Like he knew how to time things for an audience. Mm. And yet it felt like he just removed his own mask, let his heart and his, you know, I'm not happy about this, but I understand. Mm. He didn't say, hey, my assistant is leaving. He just got out there and was really his soul was in his body and he was speaking from there mm. and when he was done my friend turned to me and said did you tell him you were leaving this morning and I said yep mm. oh, that vulnerability piece which you mentioned visionary the word visionary and I know that that's huge in leadership because mm -hmm. one of my definitions of leadership is seeing further ahead for that person than they can see for themselves or that group of people. So it yeah. is a lot about developing vision. So what, what do you, you talk about something called visionary leadership must haves. Mm -hmm. What's that about? Mm -hmm. One, we've kind of been talking about the, the visionary leader needs to be able to speak and share their vision and share the path to change in a way that people feel inspired and almost feel the vision come to life in themselves. The mm. other part is a creative friction between deep presence in this moment from acceptance while moving forward toward the change that we want to bring that we see or feel as our vision. Mm. Um, so often we tend to be in resistance, which is different. If I'm in this moment and I'm resisting and like, there's a part of me that's temper tantruming, this isn't good enough. That's different than I accept where things are now. I'm deeply present. I can see the people walking by the street behind the camera. And I'm also moving toward this new vision. And in this moment, I'm doing what I feel called to do, to be moving toward that, which is a very different, more open, collaborative energy yeah. than yeah. it's not good enough. I'm going to try right. to change it. And I, do, I know it because I've done it all. <laughs> well, and there are people that I've, that I, leaders, let's just say, or who are in a leadership capacity where I'm listening to them and they're trying to um, give us as an audience their vision. And it just doesn't move like it, because I don't know if you would agree with this, but like most of the decisions we make are emotionally based because it's creating some kind of a somatic impact in our bodies. And so we're very feelings driven. And so if we feel something, typically we'll you know, would, you know, we're more likely to catch the vision, if you will. Yeah. But it was just kind of like that person's agenda. And I've seen this over and over and over again, where it's more about them and less about moving their consciousness, let's just say, or, or really, really like they have their own agenda, whether it's money driven or they're even trying to manipulate. And I, I can pick that up now. Like I am really sensitive to that now. So yeah. So what are some things that I know, cause you talk about raising consciousness through voice, mm -hmm. but you also talk about that sensitivity with visionary leaders. Mm -hmm. I, I can kind of see how those sort of go together. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, if you are sensitive, you're going to have the impact on the consciousness. If you're just in there with blazing through, and like you said, not being present and in the moment, yeah. it's really difficult to move people or to get them engaged with your movement or vision. Yeah. And it, it even ties back to being seen. Mm. If I'm sensitive and I'm speaking in front of a crowd and all of the energy and emotions in the room are causing me to close down and hide, mm -hmm. 
I might be tempted to try to kind of wall myself off and come from my head because that feels safer Mm -hmm. than to learn. I believe the sensitive souls among us have a faster path to true presence or true charisma Mm -hmm. than people who don't have that because we can feel, see, sense the vibe in the room. Yeah, you can read the room, really. (laughs) We can read the room. So we can time the whole journey that we're inviting people to go on when we're speaking differently than someone who can't feel that at all. Mm -hmm. Um, And we have to let our energetic armor and our emotional masks go and come from our hearts or our guts And when people make that shift, particularly if it's in a group, so we've got not not just me, we've got the person Mm -hmm. who shifts and we've got some other people there. And when I say, how is that different? Mm -hmm. They'll usually point to their head and say, the first time I understood them, the second time I got them, Mm -hmm. or I was hanging on every word, couldn't take my eyes off of them, I heard things that I didn't even hear the first time. Mm -hmm. Or they were Um, speaking right to me. I felt like they were speaking right to me. Yeah. I felt like they were speaking right to me, which also has to do, you know, if you're talking to a football stadium, how is it possible that every single person in the audience feels like you were speaking right to them Mm -hmm. because you were holding them and present in your body and connecting to people while including everyone else. So even if they can't tell if your eyes actually look to them, Mm -hmm. they still feel like the person was speaking directly to them. Mm, Beautiful. And then they feel seen and heard, right? That's the goal. It is not about that speaker's agenda. It's how they make them, those people feel inspired and moved and and empowered themselves. Yeah. Um, how, How do we raise the consciousness through our voice and speaking what's that Mm. process i I may have to grab a prop for this (laughs) yes those of you watching on youtube can check out her prop (laughs) it's a tibetan singing bowl we have been raised in a world that's asking us to suppress and fit in Mm -hmm. suppress your emotions and when we suppress our emotions it gets stored in our body and over time it becomes this habit of suppression so it's like we're showing up like this Mm -hmm. when we were all born with the possibility and we can recapture a way of speaking like this i feel that reverberation like the i have some tibetan bowls right over here yeah (laughs) And it's beautiful, beautiful analogy. Yeah, it's still going. And because of the way I'm built, because of what my soul is here to do, when I see people speaking, I know their instrument is them, including their body. Mm -hmm. And most of us have been training, depending on how old we are, for like, you know, 30, 50 years to be suppressed and our consciousness may be moving, but it's like looking at the pictures of evolution where man, Mm -hmm. you know, started hunched over and then eventually was walking upright. To me, there's the same thing going on with voice that when the body becomes an instrument that can open and allow that full resonance the vocal resonance and the energetic resonance, Mm -hmm. that is the shift in consciousness showing up in the body so that it's like it's complete instead of I'm shifting in my head, but I'm still, it's like my house is too small, my house being my body, Mm -hmm. or my shoes are too small. Our body could be withered And it means that the raise in consciousness is not as complete as it could be if the body is supporting that resonant voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that resonance is carried into the hearts 
of others who, yeah, I, um, I've experienced that phenomenon both as a speaker on stage and then also as a recipient. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of the reasons I started podcasting because I, I just know the power, the vibrational carriage of words into someone's soul, into their heart, their mind, their body. So that somatic process, it just fascinates me mm -hmm. from a frequency standpoint. Yeah. Um, you say here, you envision a world in which everyone shares the vibration of their soul's purpose through their voices. And together we reach global harmony. It reminds me of coherence, global harmony. That's beautiful. Do you want to just expand on that just a bit? Yeah. Part of it is having the yeah. version of ourselves. Yeah. And I feel like if earth, if every human on the earth is part of a human orchestra, what's been happening up until this point is it's like the whole string section has decided not to play or to try to play really quietly and not very often. I like how there's and, a siren kind of illustrating this in the background, the orchestra. Yeah. <laughs> it's going, see me, hear me, yeah, let yeah, it yeah. Ring out. <laughs> Um, so the strings are not playing as fully as they could. And then the percussion section starts to try to beat harder to make up for the lack of the full string section, but they can't. Mm. A drum can't be a string instrument and a str string instrument can't be a drum. If every human speaks from their soul's voice, fully, then we would get to the answers that we need more quickly and with a lot more harmony in how we're getting there mm -hmm. instead of like, you know, the drums banging your head against the wall, expecting different results. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a really powerful metaphor. Well, uh, this is also fascinating just about presence too, because you talk about that too, you know, um, there's this term, I'm sure you're familiar with it. There's many definitions, but presencing where it's sort of like what you're saying or who you are, or what you vibrate is speaking so loudly. I actually cannot hear anything you're saying, <laughs> you know, because there's just this tension they carry or just, just, you know, some dissonance where it's like, I can't even hear you. I don't even. And I think as parents, when we can get into that state where our kids are not listening to us at all, because they're sensing our presence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when I'm working with someone and enough is off, if their inner critics have control of how they're doing something if their body doesn't feel aligned with their soul, if something is blocking the vibration, it's almost like they're static and they're talking. And to me, it might as well be coming out. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's mm -hmm. like, I can't, I cannot yeah. hear what you're saying until we get things more aligned. You're coming more from your soul's intention, mm -hmm. your body, your breath, and your energy are supporting that. Mm -hmm. then it's like the message coming out of their mouth and their vibration match. And all of a sudden I can hear every single word that they're saying and make sense of it. So what are just a couple ways kind of as we wrap up that you have found that help people to really have that strong presence? Let's say they're going to be speaking or they just want to step into that leadership role and be taken seriously. Like, what is that magic, maybe a couple things that people can do to kind of land into that presence? Yeah, I like, I like to give things in threes because three is so sticky for our brains. <laughs> yeah. And I've started giving it in three words so that people can be repeating it like a mantra and I'll break it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. The three words are intend, align, invite. Mm. Intending is setting a soul-driven intention for what we want them to feel. Mm. Align is aligning the body, opening the heart, 
the body, the breath, and the energy with our highest self or with that intention. Inviting is then inviting people to join us on our journey. And it's a very open-hearted, energetic arms out, want to join us, and then letting them have the responsibility and the choice for whether or not they come on that day. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is, it can be really challenging to do that last part of, I'm here fully inviting you. And if your choice is not to come today, I accept that. And I will ask again tomorrow. Mm. Just kind of detaching from the outcome of not being so attached to what they choose into and just being, that shows confidence. I feel like that's just in, garners trust with others. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah, I love it. So intend in online and invite. Yes. That's great. Well, uh, where is it, Lori, that people can find you online? Where is the best place or two places? The best two places are probably my website, number one, www.voice-matters.com. And then second would probably be Facebook. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I'm... Sorry, I was going to ask, you have a group or uh, an actual page or? I have a group and a page. My page is Voice Matters and my group is Authentic Speaking for Visionary Souls, which mm -hmm. may be easier to find than the Voice Matters. Authentic Speaking for Visionary Souls. I'm actually typing that right now because here's what I'm, I'm sure you're seeing this too. There are so many visionaries on the planet right now. Like they've literally incarnated all over the place of mm -hmm. all ages and stations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, they're gathering, you know, yeah. it sounds like you're a gatherer of them as well, but I mean, they, they are the ones, we are the ones who will be ushering this new era of whatever's happening, <laughs> who even knows yeah. of, of people being in their own bodies of people be presencing of people um, releasing the fears of visibility and just showing up to serve. Don't you feel like there's just this real movement around that, that they're, they're all kind of gathering and galvanizing with each other. Yeah. I, yeah. I definitely feel like that's true. And I've been in business for 15 years and back then it sort of felt like I'm telling the world I'm here and it seems like there are the people aren't ready for all of it yet. Mm -hmm. And now it feels like we've been in a wave of this shift growing and changing and getting stronger. And now 15 years in, I can see mm -hmm. they are out there. And I think part of it 15 years ago was my own stuff blocking the people. And part of it is the, the wave is rising. Something's yeah. happening and it's gaining momentum. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we can't be in that fear state of um, like things unraveling and whatnot. That's a necessary piece to this way of sort of taking over these old paradigms and ways of thinking and being and doing that have not served us as a collective. And so I love that you teach this consciousness piece with voice. That's mm -hmm. really, really powerful. So thank you so much for being guests today. I've really enjoyed this discussion. Thank you. Me too. Thank you.